Well, Maria Teresa, it's, it's, it's rather like watching one's whole life pass before you when, when you hear this sort of thing. Um, I can only say that it was wrong in so many respects. First, um, I'm not acclaimed. Second, I'm not an expert. Um, apart from that, I'm British and I'm full of understatements. So um, I think one of the first general comment I would like to make in two very interesting preceding uh, presentations is that, like these presentations, there's no lack of interest at political level. There's no lack of action at political level, be it national, perhaps regional, national, and uh, international level, and certainly European level. Um, the interesting question is, is it any use, and will it be any use? Um, we are, I think, what, what I believe will, will be seen as we look back in a transitional phase, a long transitional phase, as we move from something when I first became chair of an, a regulatory authority in Great Britain as being a relatively straightforward activity of economic regulation. And we have gone from that, and I think the closest in, when I started in 2003 was about dealing with vulnerable consumers, still a problem, a growing problem. After the in the 10 years that I was a, 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 the chair of, um, of Ofgem, the complexity and the broadening out of policies for regulators has become evident and for the associations that Maria Theresa has mentioned. And I think this transitional phase has, made, has placed upon all of us, um, industry, regulators, policy makers, and so on, and even academics, although academics love swimming in the fields of electricity ever since the beginning. They've now got electricity and sustainability uh, and other cha and technological change, so this is a very happy, happy area for them. The structure of what I'm going to say, uh, perhaps I exaggerate in saying a structure, but very generally is to give an idea of those broader EU policies, to talk a little bit about regulatory challenges and our response, and to advertise something that I think will be of interest to you. The broader policy context and the regulatory actions, I think, if I make my first um, brave assumption in this present conference, those general policies are, in my view, of far more importance than the specific innovatory activities. Put another way, if you get the broad policy wrong, as Mr. Villaseca said, you spend an awful lot of wasted money in dealing with innovatory activities. Worthy, probably very useful, and certainly helpful to the researchers and so on, but not appropriate unless you get the broader context of, policy, of energy policy correct. I think I will touch on some of the challenges which make the, an absolute necessity for a sensible innovatory policy and for much research. I think some of the statistics that Laura provided were extremely interesting. Um, but I could see if, it's, if we get the policy wrong, it will be another waste of money. I exaggerate. There's a British overstatement. So I think what one has to look at is to manage this transitional phase in an effective way, making sure you have a cost-benefit analysis. And I think Laura mentioned the UK and others' interests in how the money is spent rather than the quantum of the money that is spent. Perhaps that is a preoccupation of the Anglo-Saxon, but I think more and more people see that you, you have to have a very clear idea of what you're trying to tackle and rather aim ahead rather than deal with today's problems, which very often from the research side is a much more convenient way of dealing with it. So I think this is a really big challenge. I wanted to touch again on, on Mr. Villaseca's comments, which I thought were very interesting. But making, again, a second observation, which is the proposals, which I'm going to refer to in a moment, which follow the 2003-2009 uh, third package measures at EU level, are only proposals. They are just that. There's still a long way to go before we get to the point of um, agreement on these measures. And just so that I give substance to what I'm saying, let me just quickly identify the key elements of those. First, the binding green, this is commission proposals, binding greenhouse gas reduction targets, which is setting a 40% reduction on the 1990 levels. Second, binding renewable energy targets. Again, EU-wide, 
a good question, I think, would be, so what does each member state, how bound is each member state to this, uh, this, this figure? So binding targets for renewable energy of at least 27% 20 in 2030. Energy efficiency, in my view, the neglected area, very difficult, very worthy, and really the, the central issue of how we manage to convince mainly households, small industries, to uh, improve radically their contribution to the exercise. Reform desperately needed of the EU ETS form with the establishment of the market stability reserve um, at the beginning of the next ETS trading uh, period in 2021, creating a reserve to deal with the surplus, if ever, to deal with the surplus of emission allowances that have built up and improve the, how the allowances will be operated. Fifthly, to establish a competitive, affordable, secure energy with, um, this is of course part of my and other uh, regulators and other politicians' bread and butter business. But what I think the Commission is now proposing and will have no difficulty introducing are a series of key indicators to assess the progress that is being made. Very useful to have a quantification of what we're doing. And fin not finally, really, because there's a, 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 some extremely interesting work on energy prices, which I think will show, uh, has already shown, I haven't actually read the documents as yet, they're, recent, they're so recent, where a report on energy prices showing that actually wholesale prices tending to drop down, and I think, as Mr. Villasecca said, a good deal of money being spent to boost the prices of energy for consumers um, and the costs involved in that. And this, the really crucial part of that will be in respect of the second report that is not yet prepared that will be available for the March the 2021st uh, European Council, um, which will discuss that package and though the message that, that with regard to, to uh, energy prices. So that is what, what is happening at, in a broader European level against a lot of activity in previous years at European level and, of course, at national level. But I'm here as a regulator. One of the key messages that every regulator has beaten into his or her heads is that regulators don't make policy. If I were speaking to a German audience, I would say that is Quatsch, which means that is rubbish, because regulators, by their actions and by their decisions, and by the way in which they formulate policies, inevitably create a form of policy. But what we're clearly not uh, in the business of doing is to set the political targets, is to set the broad parameters, and to subsidize. I mentioned, incidentally, um, Mr. Villasecca didn't mention it. There is quite a lot of work going on by the regulators in terms of looking at what each country is doing by way of subsidising renewable energy. And very recently, the Commission in uh, DG Competition produced some um, very interesting analyses of how they are proposing to regulate guide its guidance, how they are proposing to regulate the um, uh, future subsidies in that area. This will be a crucial, as Spain well knows, given the experience you've had in the last few years, this will be a crucial aspect of ensuring that there is a sensible uh, future-driven policy of renewable support rather than simply rewarding a retrospective um, uh, technology. The value of targets, of course, and the, what I've just mentioned to you in terms of the European Union's newer targets, is that it does focus attention. Um, unfortunately, occasionally targets are developed. A small anecdote from my part, I know, as a matter of fact, that in establishing those famous 2020 targets, um, our, our European heads of government didn't actually know that uh, the, 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 the actual components of the electricity target that was being mentioned on renewables. And this meant that, in fact, they were much more tough than, in fact, they had intended. I don't think that's a criticism, but if your European councils are seeing, uh, you're very, very restricted and very, very intense, but is, in this complex area, it's important to get sensible, um, sensible targets. One of the most important points that I think Mr. Villaseca said was the need for stability. Um, 
I think that is probably the most significant statement I'm going to make in my short presentation. We need stability as regulators. We need to introduce regulator stability, not only because of the, for the energy companies and increasingly, I think, the non-energy companies, but also we need, we need to give investors the confidence to make these large-scale investments. It is counterproductive to constantly change policies and structures. I, I will say no more because I know that Spain has also engaged, it recently um, had a, a change in its regulatory structure. Um, and of course politicians, uh, min ministers have every right to do this, but in, it, it, it does not help in a changing situation to have these sorts of uh, aspects, um, moving, moving parts. So what do I want to say about the role of regulators? First, they bring objectivity. They bring, if they are correctly organised, they bring an independence that is sometimes infuriating to, min to ministerial teams, but also very helpful when things go wrong because there is somebody to blame. They also provide reassurance to the market, and I think independent regulators operating within the system of predictable regulation can help to manage the risks associated with major change and particularly with innovation. If we do not manage such risks, I think it will clear the consumers, all aspects of consumers, will pay. Competitiveness, crucial for energy intensive industries, but not only that, um, we've all seen recent comparison between the input prices in the US compared with those here in terms of the gas, gas prices. Um, and it will discourage investment, and at a time, a transitional period, that investment will be crucial. For the regulatory, from the regulatory side, we, I think, are trying to introduce um, a greater level of stability. I only mentioned my own, which is something called RIO, R-I-I-O, which introduces a longer time frame, encouraging innovation, encouraging uh, a, a regulatory approach towards price reviews, which incentivizes the um, uh, companies to take a proper forward long-term look, in our case, eight years. It's Rio, R-I-I-O. But there is a great deal of uncertainty, and I mentioned this. Let me just give you a few, not least the uncertainty over the whole, business, the whole um, effect of climate change and the uncertainty over security of supply. In our analyses at European level, these are a few of the points that you will see reflected in, in some slides that I'm going to come to in a moment. The future role of gas how much and how useful uh, that will be is uncertain across the Union. I think one of the interesting points that perhaps Mr. Villersecker didn't make was that we have been saved in a way by a recession. In many cases, the, re the reduction in demand across the Union, but in, certainly in, in many member states, has eased the problem of the change and the shortages. Of course, as we come out, hopefully, as we come out of that recession, it will be all the worse if we don't respond in, 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 in good measure. So, role, but nonetheless, the role of gas is uncertain. The role of consumers is undeniably changing, and their power base needs to change with it. There is a far higher percentage, and we've heard the levels of what are inflexible, unprogrammable, renewable generation. We can no longer have a single point what unidirectional flow on generation, and this is, makes balancing of the system extremely difficult. The development of smart grids and greater distribution connected generation means that you, the, the importance of controlling distribution networks is not only possible, but actually even more essential. There will be new players. I think probably, if I were an academic, this is the area that I would really look at. Because we, in the energy sector, think energy, we think energy companies. Google, play, Google recently paid billions for a, a company called Nest, which allows um, the automatic operation of household appliances and so on, balances system. And that will be the real delivery of energy efficiency. In the UK now, increasingly, IT companies are having to play a greater and greater role in terms of managing the system more effectively. 
and that will have a big impact in terms of the energy usages. But there are downsides or downsides or benefits. There are huge volumes of data. There is concerns about the confidentiality in a number of, the, a number of countries. You will not be surprised that Netherlands being one. Is the data about a particular house going to be abused? But also, how do you manage this huge amounts of data? There will be new players in the market. I don't mean the IT players, I mean the aggregators in order to improve the potential for lowering prices to consumers, serv providing services to consumers. And so, and the new technologies. I could go on. And now I'm going to deal with, with perfection. The, the dictatrice on my left is telling me I have five <laughs> minutes. Um, I'm now going to tell you, this is the advertisement. We've got to try and understand what is going on as regulators and we tend to look as I think many companies countries do very much at our toes very near to ourselves we felt that we needed to um, look forward and look in a strategic way and <laughs> I hope you know one of the things I need is help to operate the system can, can somebody wind it up came to here okay then I keep it I had, a, I had a suspicion that I wouldn't press the right, uh, the right thing, having been untrained. No, that's a good one. See, if you Excellent. want, I can pass Perfect. the slides for you. Sorry? I don't think... You do it for me. Yeah, I can do it for you. This is, um, can we get that? This is something we are calling the, the 2025 bridge, a bridge to 2025. 2014, in theory, we have an energy, uh, uh, in a single energy market, clearly not completed but getting towards a more integrated market. I, I take the point on the Iberian isolation. What we are looking at as regulators is how we can bridge to, a, to the middle of the 20, 20, 2020s, how we can bridge that gap f to allow for the 20, new 2020 target and the 2030 and indeed the 2050 horizons that the politicians are thinking of. And therefore, these pillars that are spoken of at the bottom gas, electricity and consumers and, and distribution system operators. These are areas that we are particularly looking at. Innovation comes within that. Do, what do I do next? Do I press that one? Yeah, yeah. I just press this one. Next one. Yeah. Ah, okay. I don't do anything. I press for you. Excellent. There's a timeline, um, and I mention this because there, there, we do encourage people strongly to contribute to this, and we are giving a long period. We're, we're, we are about to come out with a green paper, a consultation paper, in March 14. Um, in the end, a couple of months, two months of, of consultation, um, a, a, in which there will be a, a shareholder workshop, and, and out, undeniably, and then we will come out with that dreadful word, the vision, the bridge itself in September, October this year. This will be, we hope, useful contribution towards a new commission, a new college of commissioners, a new parliament, and the many challenges that we shall face. What, what do we actually do? Um, some ways we think we will actually contribute. One, flexibility to ensure that the rise price signals and uh, arrive, that regulatory barriers arrive, better forecasting, liquidity. Two, very important, the demand side. In removing barriers so that the demand side will take a much more active role in this, uh, in making investment in smart uh, technology and providing a framework which allows that to happen. Three, encouraging competition, which tends to be lost in, uh, when we're in difficulties of this sort. Uh, divining we do not think we should pick the winners of technology, but we should facilitate the emergence of new technologies and find good wholesale market arrangements to encourage and to filter through to a better retail market. And making consumers more powerful, more effective, prosumers as, uh, as contributors and assuming to the next uh, issue. This consumer involvement will undoubtedly be uh, important. Here are three areas that we think are important. And we have a, a something called a 2020 vision. This will be, a, if you like, a 2020 customer vision plus, where we think that new areas need to be developed, but still, build, still built upon the, um, the ne the, uh, uh, our present basis. Next slide, please. We're not only looking within Europe for answers. We participate in the International Confederation of Energy Regulators, which, uh, which 
which many of my colleagues are here, um, which really look at a whole range of different issues in collaboration with other regulators. We collaborate bilaterally with US states. Interestingly, some states are actually making major contributions to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is, I think belies the question the US is not doing anything. It's not doing anything the way the US, the, the, the Europe does. We collaborate bilaterally with the Russians, with the Americans, and with others. People are quite interested, for example, Israel are interested too. And we have very uh, good con conversations with these different countries. So here are my conclusions, and I won't get the, I won't get the rap on the knuckles from, uh, from Maria Theresa. <laughs> One, we're trying to create a competitive, secure, and sustainable single energy market. I think the balancing of this, I was going to say triptych of issues, sustainability, security of supply, competitiveness, has, is a real challenge to, to policymakers and to us. Balancing it longer term and dealing with innovation within that is a really major issue. Regulation has to evolve to meet the targets that are now being set. Sound regula regulation, independence, independent regulators, I think will be crucial to the future. And, and I see, as I've made public recently in, in a recent speech, I see real risks if regulators at national level are lose some, of, some or, or much of their independence. The political intrusion is not good in a long-term basis for, for energy. Understanding as much as possible what the future challenges are going to be, and that's a very good starting point. I think in the distribution system, that is going to be one of the most interesting areas. I think there will be, and there is work going on in the US at the moment, an organization that I also um, I'm on advisory councils, which you do at my stage of life. Um, is, is EPRI has many interesting words to talk about distribution systems. So Europe is not alone, but probably only these two big major power blocks are actually contributing in that area. And finally, but not finally, consumers, particularly small and small industry companies um, and small consumers, household consumers, need to have a much more active role in the active investment. I could go on, but I know that I would be murdered, so thank you very much.